During this session, we'll hear an overview of the many physical risks of climate change from renowned climate scientist, Rosina Bierbaum, professor and dean emerita at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment and professor at the University of Maryland. Then we'll connect the dots to what this reality means for investors and companies, hearing from three financial services and investment professionals about managing climate risks, the economic costs of inaction, and the opportunities for investors and companies to adapt and become more resilient to climate impacts. Joining us today are Michaela Edwards, partner at Capricorn Investment Group, Emily Mazzucarati, Global Head of Climate Solutions for the Moody's Corporation, as well as CEO and founder of 427, and Murray Burt, Senior ESG Strategist at DWS, along with Lindsay White, Director of the Series Investor Network. And now let's get this conversation started. Thank you very much. Climate change is not some future threat. It is here right now and steadily getting worse. The time to tackle it is short. It is not our only global crisis. There are many drivers on Earth's limited resources, human demand to produce and consume, climate change, ecosystem decline, but also surprises of which COVID is the latest, but by no means the only one. We need to think about all of these together as we pursue a sustainable planet for future generations. This ice core record of measured carbon dioxide shows how anomalous today's 416 parts per million is, given that over the almost 1 million years of record here, carbon dioxide ranged between 180 and 280 parts per million. And the massive growth since the Industrial Revolution has happened in a geological blink of an eye. Since the Industrial Revolution, you can see how quickly the temperatures are going up. 2020 was tied for the hottest year on record. The last eight years are the hottest years on record. And each of the last five decades have been hotter than the previous one. That temperature increase is melting ice everywhere. Summer sea ice that once was the extent of the yellow line you see has been reduced by about the area of the size of India and that warmer dark water absorbs heat. On the right, you see the steady decline in land-based ice that contributes to sea level rise in Antarctica and in Greenland, and all together with glacier melting, we are losing a total of about 1 trillion tons of ice each year. This rapid melting of polar ice and the warming of the Arctic is contributing to the wobbling of the jet stream and incursions of cold air southward to Texas, as we just saw, but also there can be incursions of warm air north, as we also saw in Siberia. Serious harm from climate change is occurring already. The warming speeds up the water cycle of the planet that leads to more total rainfall, but also faster drying out of the interior of continents, and that leads to drought. So we have disruptions in food supply and water, in energy, in supply chains, and the warmer oceans are fueling more energy to hurricanes, which are becoming more destructive. And, and all this causes harm to humans, to infrastructure, and to ecosystems. So if you look at all these weather-related disasters as compiled by Munich Ray, you see that the number of weather-related catastrophes was about 200 in 1980, and you see it's risen to about 600 on average in the last decade. In fact, in 2020, there were 900 events totaling $210 billion. But we have Paris, right? Well, I wanna make five key points about the Paris Climate Accord. It is absolutely a very important agreement, but it will not achieve the two degrees Celsius or the one and a half degree aspirational goal the world has set to really be on a 1.5 degrees Celsius level increase over pre-industrial levels. Emissions have to drop 50% in this decade. So we have to ramp up ambition quickly across all countries. We have to double or triple it. 
We are now about one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels now. We could go through 1.5 degrees as soon as 2030. And that's why you hear this decade is crucial. And we're currently on the path to a three or four degree world. Well, let's look at this graphically. Here, the deflection on the graph from the turquoise and the red bands is what the Paris Agreement can achieve if fully implemented. But look at that steep bend in emissions needed this decade to be on either the one and a half or two degree path. And then over the longer term, emissions have to be zero. That is the green line. And despite the smear of scenarios you see, zero emissions have to be achieved by no later than 2060. And for that to happen, we need a whole new range of technological breakthroughs and massive deployment and very fast. We will need public-private partnerships to make it happen. There's absolutely not enough public money. One area that's been very much under attended to that is very much needed is the role that nature can play in reducing emissions over this coming decade. Perhaps as much as one third of those emissions that I showed you. There is a huge amount of carbon that protected areas better management of farming and soils, as well as restoration of degraded lands can additionally hold carbon and we need all of that. And if you look at the levels of risk as the world scientific community has summarized them in their last four reports from the left in 2001 to the right in 2018, where the redness of the bar indicates worse levels of risk, you can see that by the most recent report, risk is now considered high at the one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels that we are at today. Why? In the last decade, evidence has mounted that nine tipping points are being approached, including complete loss of coral reefs, the loss of the lungs of the planet, the Amazon and the boreal forests, the ice sheets, as I've shown you, or even disruption of the ocean conveyor belt. And, and each of these tipping points would have global impacts, sea level rise or the rapid release of carbon dioxide and runaway warming or massive disruption of ecosystems or all of the above. There is quite a litany of future worries I could show you. The new trend in rapidly intensifying hurricanes, the 160 36 port cities of the world at risk of sea level rise. But let me just show you this one, a projection of crop productivity across 13 cereal crops. And the reds are decreasing productivity and the darkest reds are a 50% drop. And where is that? In the countries by 2050 where already poverty and famine are common and rampant. And this scenario is before we overlay increasing droughts and floods and hurricanes but you can see that supply chains will be affected. Extreme events will continue. Heat waves, floods, fires. Climate change is deemed a national security threat in some 10 recent US reports, a threat multiplier, if you will, and a readiness issue. Investors are sounding the alarm, increasingly calling for risk disclosure, reduced emissions, reduced vulnerability. And we have seen PG&E declared the first S&P 500 climate casualty. A lot of these climate impacts will occur simultaneously and companies must be prepared for it. Here is a map of wildfire risk in the next 10 to 30 years for the S&P 500. And while companies funneled some $500 billion to climate change investments last year, only 6% focused on adapting to these ongoing and accelerating changes. And here is the heat wave risk. Some countries have already seen temperatures that are reaching physiological limits for humans or animals to be outside. For example, heat indices of over 130 degrees. I want to come back to where I began, that all climate change, biodiversity loss, and the continuing demand for resources and surprises need to be tackled simultaneously. 
In 2020, the World Economic Forum had five completely environmental risks as their most likely risks. These are the green ones. And you see in 2021, infectious diseases joined the environmental list. And in a separate report on COVID-19, they noted the interconnected nature of emerging infectious diseases, biodiversity loss and climate change and argued we must attack them all simultaneously. Human well-being depends equally on ecological capital, social capital, and economic capital. But we have tended to discount two thirds of the legs of this stool. So as we seek to build back better, we need to think about building back greener COVID recovery packages. And indeed, if you look at the sustainable development goals, the bedrock goals are life on land and life in the water, the stability on which our societal goals and ultimately the top layer, our economy rely. The time to act is now. We can delay and pay or we can plan and prosper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosina. We will now welcome three members of the Series Investor Network and the Series Company Network, Moody's Corporation, Capricorn Investment Group, and DWS. They will share their insights on the economic implications of physical climate risks and will describe their approach to the analysis and incorporation of climate science data as a key part of fundamental investment analysis. Finally, they will describe how that analysis positions both companies and investors to manage risks and capture investment opportunities aligned with the acceleration towards a net zero global economy. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Emily Mazzucarati of Moody's and 427. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Sirius, for convening this panel. Climate change has emerged as one of the dominant issues of our time, in terms of impacts on communities and ecosystems, but also in terms of economic and financial impacts. These impacts manifest at the macroeconomic level, as well as at the company and facility level. They touch every asset class, every sector, every region. In a recent report, the Financial Stability Board noted that physical climate risk could lead to a sharp fall in asset prices, an increase in uncertainty, and destabilizing efforts on the financial systems, including in the relatively short term. New analytics released by Moody's ESG Solutions and 427 project that by 2040, the number of people exposed to damaging floods will rise from 2.2 to 3.6 billion people. That's almost 41% of the global population. Roughly $78 trillion, the equivalent of 57% of the world's current GDP will be exposed to flooding. The same pattern can be observed for other climate hazards. We found that 25% of the world's population in 2040 could be in areas where the frequency and severity of hot days far exceed local historical extremes with negative implications for human health, labor productivity, and agriculture. This data can be explored on the New York Times features that's referenced here. This exposure to climate hazards necessarily leads to economic impact. Moody's Analytics has integrated the impacts of chronic climate change in its macroeconomic models and found that climate change could cost $69 trillion by 2100 under a two degree scenario, not even the worst case scenario. The models incorporate different channels ranging from impacts on heat and labor productivity to agriculture, tourism, energy price, and sea level rise. It finds that rising temperature will universally hurt worker health and productivity, and that more frequent extreme weather event will increasingly disrupt and damage critical infrastructure and property. The same exposure to climate risk can also translate as impact on credit ratings. A recent report from Moody's Investor Service found that physical climate risk was material, especially for emerging markets, with 43% of sovereigns in this region ranked with a highly negative, a very highly negative exposure to climate. For example, Bangladesh's propensity to flooding 
the volatility of seasonal monsoon rainfall and a relatively high depletion rate of its freshwater resources creates economic and social costs, which are compounded by the country's low incomes and infrastructure quality. A similar pattern arises in other regions. In the case of Mozambique, for example, exposure to physical climate risk is very high, given the economic importance of the primary sector dominated by subsistence agriculture, which is particularly vulnerable. Other sovereigns reliant on subsistence agriculture with weak infrastructure, health systems, and prone to recurring drought or storms are similarly exposed to climate risk. Natural disasters can curb economic output, exacerbate property, poverty, deter future investment, and potentially raise social tension. Physical hazards also directly affect corporations, both productive assets and supply chain. In this example here, we looked at the impact on facilities held, owned, or operated by corporations in uh, Vietnam, global corporation. Um, Vietnam stood out as we looked at the overall ASEAN region because one third of manufacturing facilities in the region are exposed to floods. All of the facilities are exposed to high heat stress and almost half of them has high exposure to hurricanes and typhoons. Vietnam's key exports include broadcasting equipment, telephones, integrated circuits, uh, textile footwear, leather footwear. You can only think of the depth of the impact in supply chains and for corporations that rely on local manufacturing capabilities. In another analysis, we looked at the impacts on chemical manufacturing, including pharma, and we found that for more than half of the companies, one in five facility had high exposure to the risk of floods. If you think of the dependency of the global economy right now on pharmaceutical facilities' ability to produce vaccine for COVID, you can only think of the ripple impact when climate and extreme weather events disrupt these productions. Just like for sovereign, physical impacts also affect performance and credit risk. Moody's analytics modeling of impact of physical uh, climate change on credit risk shows an increase in the probability of default for firms that have high exposure to climate risk. In this example, we see that Chevron, um, which, I had, which has high exposure to its facilities, we're showing uh, floods in this example, um, sees an increase in its probability of default going forward, driven by the exposure to climate change. Climate risk touches everyone and every corporation. We're so also seeing the same impact on real estate. Um, in this specific example, we're looking at the impact of floods on commercial real estate in the US. The modeling team um, looked at um, past the, uh, the impact of past uh, floods to see how rent, vacancy rates, operating expense, and net operating income had evolved over time following those impacts. These changes help us understand how extreme weather event increasing in frequency and intensity will continue to drive disruption and long-term impact on each of those markets. So this is a call to action. The level of reporting what we know of risk management for those risks is insufficient. There is a need for lenders and investors to understand what are the risks they hold in their portfolio by way of the companies that they do business with. There is a need for corporations to explain and demonstrate that they are managing those risks adequately. And globally, there is a need for more investment in adaptation and resilience. Thank you again to Ceres for convening this year's event. As we've seen in Racina's and Emily's presentations, the risk opportunity equations of climate impacts has changed abruptly over the past year. Consider that in 2020 alone, the market capitalization of clean technology companies increased by nearly $1 trillion, while the market cap of oil and gas companies declined by roughly $660 billion. Markets are aggressively repricing stranded assets and exposures to high emissions. At the same time, investments in rapidly growing green industries are delivering great windfalls for investors. This dispersion indicates that climate science data is critical to risk management and also presents investment opportunities. At Capricorn, our primary focus is on the right tail opportunities, capital allocation to solution providers, so positive selection. 
we invest in future and hopefully often unrecognized growth companies with high sustainability performance, such as those with lower greenhouse gas emissions, diverse executive teams, and well-paid employees. We do risk mitigation on the left tail of the distribution by minimizing our stranded asset risk. The combination of these two strategies has delivered higher risk adjusted return over the long term. When it comes to climate data, there is no regulatory or market standard of what climate data to report on, how to report it, or even how to score it. The fact that there is no consensus speaks to the inefficiency and information disparity that exists and that creates the opportunity for an edge by utilizing climate data. What will always be central to Capricorn's methodology is the focus on the raw data. Investors rely on proprietary research to make projections about the future performance of a company. Climate data is crucial to uncover climate opportunities and manage risks. We believe the differentiation is in interpreting the primary raw data, in understanding the technology and how it addresses the specific piece of the climate change puzzle. While some sectors are more at risk, climate data is a critical consideration across investment portfolios. And if we truly want to transform tomorrow, today, we as investors have a critical role to play. Consider infrastructure, for example. The investments we make will lock in infrastructure for a multi-decade time horizon. Our due diligence must be climate conscious and must appropriately manage climate risks, as we must work toward a new net zero era of renewable energy infrastructure globally. Beyond managing climate risks, such as physical risks like extreme weather events, there is also a growing area of investment opportunities related to climate science. Let's take one of our technology investments, SailDrone, which is the world's leading collector of ocean-related data. Oceans make up more than 70% of Earth's surface, but only about 20% of the ocean has been mapped using modern high-resolution technology. Sail drones are wind and solar powered automated sailboats that crisscross the world's oceans collecting scientific data. This data is critical to combat climate change and is used by companies, governments, and scientists all over the world. Capricorn and the Skull Foundation are also among the funders of MethaneSat, an ambitious project led by the Environmental Defense Fund that will launch the world's first satellite dedicated to monitoring methane leaks globally. This will also help inform our investment activity through continuous real-time data on methane emissions from various industries which are currently unreported. We joined the Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative last year. While this is a 2050 commitment, we believe that investors need to move fast to get to Net Zero. Data on public equities is available and should inform investment decisions and portfolio re rebalancing right away. Use of high quality offsets can help the investment community reach net zero in a matter of years, not decades. More work is needed on private holdings to baseline emissions and draw out reduction plans. But even there, we believe that by working collaboratively with other investors, data providers, and organizations such as Ceres, we can achieve significant reductions this decade, including full net zero with the use of offsets. Finally, the greatest challenge may well be incentivizing investment teams so that net zero investment decisions are rewarded and low carbon investing becomes a return driven activity versus a compliance ex exercise. The value created and destroyed over the past 12 months certainly makes the case for moving this discussion from the compliance office to the investment committee. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Murray Burt of DWS. Thank you, Michaela. I work with DWS, a major asset manager with $970 billion managed for institutional and retail clients from our home market in Germany to investors around the world. We invest across a wide range of asset classes. For instance, we recently announced that our ETF, tracking the MSCI USA ESG Leaders Index, recently crossed the $3 billion mark, making it the largest such ETF. As well, we recently launched the US's first mid-cap and small-cap ESG ETFs with S&P. DWS is a long-term member of Series. We are a mem founding member of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, 
and we have one of the strongest track records voting in favor of ESG and climate resolutions in the US, according to Morningstar. My role in our research institute is to use our thematic analysis to support clients and our investment professionals in understanding and integrating sustainability into their everyday business. Our approach to physical climate risk starts with improving and understanding and building knowledge. For instance, in 2017, we partnered with Emily and our colleagues at 427 to publish one of the first investor reports analyzing physical risks in an equity portfolio. More recently, we contributed our investor perspective to an important report from S&P Global True Cost. Data providers are undertaking significant innovation to combine climate science with the location of companies, factories, and facilities. An example of this analysis is shown on this slide, illustrating that physical climate risks are much more broadly distributed across the economy, both in developed and emerging economies, than transition risks, which are more concentrated in a smaller number of sectors, according to S&P Global True Cost. Unless decisive effort is made to cut emissions, this graph is likely to change with more companies becoming exposed to higher physical climate risks in future. Investors can integrate risks, for instance, into passive investment products by underweighting high-risk companies, or as I will explain in a few minutes, to improve real estate asset resilience. However, just integrating risks into investment decision-making will not necessarily help society become more resilient. Investors also need to use our influence to help companies, communities, and governments to adapt and become as resilient as possible to climate impacts. Let me explain. While data providers are helping financial institutions to analyze climate risks, the best risk analysis should come from companies. Recognizing that there has been a gap for companies to analyze and disclose physical climate risks and opportunities, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the Global Center on Adaptation convened an expert group to advance TCFD guidance in this area. I was honored to be asked to chair the Risk Disclosure Working Group, which was very ably supported by 427 and Acclimatize, which is now part of Willis Towers Watson. One of our key recommendations is that corporates should draw on insurance sector metrics to analyze their financial value at risk from acute and chronic climate risks. As well, we basically need a net zero equivalent metric for resilience regarding how companies help their staff, suppliers, and local communities to become more resilient. This report is very useful for the many initiatives underway that are working towards harmonized and mandatory disclosures, and is also a foundation for investor engagement that you, hear, you will hear more about in future. Specifically, Ceres European sister organization, the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change, is working to develop investor expectations for companies, which I am contributing to, and I also plan to publish a DWS report on this topic in the near future. While companies can and should do a lot more to help society become more resilient, governments have a major role to play. UNIPFI convened a group of commercial and development banks, academics, and consultants to advise the Global Commission on Adaptation. I was the sole investor member of the review panel, and we provided recommendations for how the financial sector and public policies could do much more to support a more resilient future. If any listeners today work with or for governments, I also commend this report to your attention. So how can climate science actually inform investment decisions? One example is seen in DWS's private real estate funds, which have integrated climate transition risk and physical risk into decisions on whether to buy different buildings and also into annual portfolio reviews. Working with Measurable, which receives data from 427, my colleagues identified a particular property which faced significant sea level rise risk. We worked with a leading engineering consulting firm to develop a risk mitigation plan and implemented this plan, for example, by deploying movable flood protection fences. My final slide summarizes the key initiatives for governments, banks, and investors. DWS is a founding member of the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, CCRI, and we are contributing to a group that aims to integrate physical climate risks into the cash flow analysis of infrastructure projects. This initiative is strongly needed as a recent article in the academic journal Nature Climate Change found that the rules for financially assessing physical climate risks is in its infancy. For instance, CCRI believes that if an asset is more resilient, then its operating expenditures should be lower, such as by having lower repair costs due to floods. 
as well. When an asset is sold, a non-resilient asset potentially should be worth less. These hypotheses need to be integrated into investment practices for infrastructure investors. Developing new practices, investment products, and stewardship initiatives are strongly needed to help society adapt and become more resilient. Thank you.